African Safari Wildlife Park is a wild experience with over 800 exotic animals. Our drive through safari features giraffes, zebras, deer, elk, alpacas, and even a white bison, all of which you can feed right from your vehicle. Walk on the wild side with a zoo at all pass and feed kangaroos, porcupines, tortoises, and rabbits. Step into our aviary adventure and hand feed budgies for a memorable experience. Check out our live educational shows or ride a camel. Create memories that will last a lifetime at the Ohio Safari Park, African Safari Wildlife Park in Port Clinton. Well, happy Monday, everyone. Hey, it's the beginning of the work week, Pete. Yay. Yay. Aren't we so excited to be here on a another, Monday? Another chance to be productive and shine and serve the public, right? That's exactly right. It's a fresh new start, everyone. So embrace the day. Right. Okay. Yes. That's our story and we're sticking to it. That's right. And of course, Jennifer here to start off your morning show with um, <clears throat> our good friend, Pete Wilson. And Pete's morning news update brought to you by Nia Henry, agent for Appalachia Realty. If you're looking to buy or sell, call Nia before I choke to death. 418-4135. Okay. Get your tea and honey. You got, a, you got an hour to go. I know. Okay. I'll, right. I'll, I'll try to talk a little bit, well, take a little pressure off. I appreciate that, Pete. And um, But no, you have a, a big stack of news there, and um, you always have a lot to talk about on Mondays. All right. After busy, busy weekends. Right. Okay. Well, we've yeah. had busier weekends than what we just had, but, uh, you know, we're in this time, you know, the Periscope, we're looking forward instead of backwards with some of the things we're going to talk about today. And, of course... The countdown is on to the 2021 Jackson County Fair. A more and normal I know, I, I, fair, I, I, right? Right, a more normal fair. And I know, uh, whatever year that was, you that you were the horse queen. I know <laughs> that you get excited whenever that fair comes around. I do. Great memories, right? Oh, definitely great memories. Lots and lots of, of fun at the fair every year. One of the the highlights of the summer for sure. Okay. Well, anyway, this year's fair. Uh, the dates are. Uh, it, some of the some of the things actually uh, start uh, on July the fifteenth. Yes. Uh, that is next Thursday. That's harness racing. Yes. Harness racing on Thursday and Friday. Then they have really packed in some more. I guess you could call them pre-fair activities. Yeah. They consider it part of the fair, but you know the whole fair isn't quite operating yet. But there's going to be some exciting things, uh, very noteworthy things. We're going to talk about in just a minute on Saturday and Sunday, mm -hmm. and then. The full fair, you know, where all the rides are there and, and, and all the things are open and operating, that's going to be Monday through the following Saturday, yep. which would be uh, Saturday, July the 24th. And we're going to give you just a little bit of, of a preview of the fair today and talk about uh, probably the highlight event uh, that is scheduled. The first thing that we want to tell you about the fair, and this is one that I think everybody is excited about and can applaud. And we couldn't have said this a couple months ago. That is, we're going to have an unrestricted county fair. Yep. Uh, COVID-19 is a non-factor. I know that there's still some cases uh, in, you know, different places we hear on the news. It's still out there and a danger. But it is. Uh, COVID-19, no restrictions at the fair. We'll have a full fair, not just part of a fair. There'll be grandstand activities. Uh, there's no requirements about mask wearing because, you know, the high Department of Health in the state has no requirements and it's worked out pretty good so far. Uh, there'll be the grandstand entertainment events. Last year, they were able to space things out and do some of the thrill shows, but they didn't have, you know, the live entertainment. They canceled the Kentucky Headhunters or postponed the Kentucky right. Headhunters would be the right word because they knew that they needed a big crowd for that. And, you know, you gonna, weren't going to put people six feet apart and you know, make a go of it uh, from a business standpoint. And I think the Kentucky Headhunters weren't really performing last year anyway, as far as being right. out on the road at a major concert. So COVID-19, uh, not a problem this year. Everybody, uh, everybody, uh, everything, it's all systems go for a, what you would call a full functioning fair. Uh, talk with Michelle Baxter. Yes. Uh, she's been a member of the fair board for quite some time. Uh, she's kind of heading up kind of like the PR and the marketing. Mm -hmm. And so I've already talked to her, uh, you know, for uh, the news. <clears throat> and uh, she said that she sees quite a bit of enthusiasm this year, not only from the people who are putting on the fair, but people who would like to attend the fair and participate in it. Uh, last year, you know, she was calling vendors, trying to get them to come. 
uh, at this year, she's taking those calls and trying to figure out where to put everybody. That's right. So, I mean, the, the early, the early uh, indications are that it's going to be a great fair. Of course, the thing that you never can control with the fair is the weather. Is it going to be too hot? Is it going to be too rainy or whatever? But, you know, it's just part of it. It is. And, and, you know, it's county fair, man. It's 150 degrees and it rains. And that's in, on certain days. That's just how it goes. So yeah, that, that is that is how it goes. Not the first time. But but this year, we'll see. this year, one of the things that we're going to talk about here also in, in just a minute is that uh, the fair has been boosted a little bit. Of course, you know, they, they took a financial hit last year. Maybe not as bad as they feared because, you know, they did have some attendance and whatever. They had restricted operations, so it wasn't quite as expensive to operate. But in the last uh, several months, they've received some state money, including some money from a capital grant. I think there was another allocation of state money before that along the way. At the end of last year, uh, fares either received $50,000 or $25,000, depending on whether they had a fair or they didn't. Sure. So some fairs weren't held at all. I think there were about maybe seven or eight in the state that were not held at all, including the Vinton County Junior Fair. Yep. So they were able to use that money, or part of it anyway, to make some physical improvements. The fair always looking to upgrade their facilities and so forth. And that money has definitely helped in that the fact they had it, they were able to use money for other things, uh, operations and so forth. And that's a, always a push every year for the fair to figure out how much money to spend because, you know, it is still a business. You know, you can't you can't yes. go in the hole or go in the hole for very long. And if you uh, make a little bit of money, you come out a little bit ahead that gives you a little bit of uh, a head start for next year which means that maybe you can afford some better entertainment, et cetera. And when you have better entertainment and the weather cooperates, they come through the turnstiles, you get, goes, you get yeah, a better it's attendance. It's a big so, circle. So yeah, so that, that is a process, you know, that our fair board members have to go through every year planning it. There's but it's such a gamble, Pete. That's the problem. Well, Because what, you're dependent on weather and so many other right. factors that you can't control. Right. Well, one but, of the big debates that fair board members and have, you know pandemics and stuff. Exactly. <laughs> well, one of the one of the one of the um, issues that fair board members have every year, and there's a division of opinion on it, uh, and you know they, they hash it out for themselves and they make a decision. You know, do you spend a lot of money to try to bring in you know like yeah. a, a class act and and other things, knowing that you know, you're taking a risk because you need then to bring them through the turnstiles. Or do you try to keep the cost down and figure they'll come anyway, and then you get a little bit ahead, the conservative versus the liberal approach. And, and so uh, it can go either way on, on these decisions that, that, that the fair board people have to make. But once again, 21 members on the fair board, uh, it is not a one week job. They, pl no. they plan from very early in the year. They even have meetings in the fall. They're trying to find ways to use that facility, the fairgrounds, all year round right. uh, to bring money in. Uh, you know, we've had Angelia, Ka uh, Angelia Hill, Kaiser mm -hmm. Hill, uh, up here before talking about the flea markets. They're going to have four or five of those a year. That's right. Uh, they have some events there at the grandstand uh, throughout the year. They have uh, a nice meeting place in the 4-H building. You know, you can rent that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know... These are things that the that the fair board are trying to do that is beyond just what people think of the fair, which is that one week of the year. But the hallmark event that we want to talk about at the fair this year is the return of the Kentucky Headhunters. Yes. Now, 1990, uh, before you know, I tell you about what's going to happen this year with the Kentucky Headhunters. I'm going to turn to you because I know that you were a child of the 90s. Yes. So do you remember when the Kentucky Headhunters came in? Were you there? 100% remember tell that. Tell me about that night because we did a, a, a Alex Shope, uh, our editorial assistant, did a good job interviewing some of the people who were there. Of course, a very memorable event. I will tell you if you didn't read that or you didn't remember this, they were expecting a crowd of at least 3,000, which is a lot. Well, they got 10,000 plus. Yeah, I just, I remember it. And I honestly, I don't remember the concert as much as all the rigmarole around the concert. Right. And that was that, number one, the Kentucky Headhunters, it was just one of those, you know, sometimes you strike lightning strikes and, you know, they had booked them and they hadn't hit it all that huge. And then all of a sudden, bam, there they were. And they were at the top of the country charts uh, 
coming to little old Jackson, Ohio, and you know, you think, okay, it's a county fair, you get a few thousand people in, and I can just remember the lines of, of traffic and the fair board freaking out and the logistics of trying to get people in and what to do with them and, and all of that. So yeah, I do remember right, yeah, that you, all happening. You remember the traffic jam afterwards and so forth. I think the afterwards was even worse than yes. the getting in, of course, because you have a bunch of people leaving at, leaving at once. And as you know, there's one way out of the fairgrounds. Correct. So several roads within the grounds that-, that, that But it all ends that, up at that one- It, it all ends up road. there on driving Park Road. Yes. Coming out of there. And uh, and I remember that uh, Guy Wall, who is a current member of the fair board, he is the one who was a fair board member in 1990. Okay. And uh, it was his job, and I'm sure others as well, to direct <laughs> traffic. And he oh said gosh. he was working 11 hours on, on traffic between the beginning and the I'll end. I'll bet it was. But, I mean, who knows? You know, it's an open fair. Anybody's allowed to come in and just didn't know that there was going to be three or four times more people than what they thought, you know, coming through the gates. But it was amazing. Right. And, of course, the, the, the headhunters were, were very big back then. They're still performing. Uh, some of the same band members are there. Yep. Uh, I think most of them are. Uh, when Super Ale nice guys. They are. When Alex did his interview, uh, he called the uh, called the publicity folks, and we expected to get a call from some front person, you sure. know, in, in PR or marketing with the with their manager, some or, of their or, people, or, or whatever. Exactly. Yeah. And we actually had the guitarist call, and he was on the road uh, driving around Nashville. And he gave a real nice interview, a real down home uh, type of guy. Um, Got to get you his name because Kentucky Headhunter fans would probably recognize him. He was, uh, let's see, it was, uh, I believe it was Richard Young, okay, uh, who was one of the guitarists who, hey, who there they are, who, who gave us an interview. And of course, you know, they're connect there. They are right there. Yeah. There's the Kentucky Headhunters now. They still have the long hair. It looks yeah. like it may be gray now, <laughs> but but they're hanging together uh, pretty well. And of course, you know, they had the Dumas Walker song yes. that was so big with the line about the ski pop. Yep. You know, that's the <laughs> real local connection. I'm guessing that they're going to sing that again. I'm guessing that's probably a fair when, bet when they're here. But fair they, bet, but unintended. Exactly. Well, <laughs> they remember. Uh, based on an interview, they remember the trip to Jackson County and they wanted to come back. They didn't want to see it canceled. And so they did make provisions last year so good. that, you know, instead of last year, they would come this year. So they were going to come last year for the 30th anniversary of their appearance in 1990. So it's actually going to be the 31st year, hey, but, but you know, you they're, know, they're glad to have them. The concert is going to be this Saturday. So it's one of those right. pre-weekend events. It's going to be at 8 p.m. And uh, here's the deal. Where are you going to be able to see a big Nashville uh, group like this that's got a national name for $10? That's the gate admission. You know, whatever else you might want to do at the fair, it's probably going to be the Kentucky Headhunters that day because not a lot of other things are going on. But the gate admission of $10 covers your seat. There now, you go. Uh, in the past, they've, done, they've sold some premium seating in advance. Uh, a little bit. They've even done a dinner before. Uh, yes. None of that this year. Uh, it is first come, first serve. So, okay. you know, I think you're going to see some people come early. There's not only all the grandstand seating, but there is track seating, but they're not going to have the chairs there. You've got to bring your oh, so own are chair. Are you allowed to bring you your can, own you, chair? You can, bring, okay. you can bring your own chair and sit oh, it down there in the there's dirt. There's going to be people just in fist fights over that. Right. Yeah. And, but anyway, those tickets do not cost you, you know, $20 or $30 or $40 for that premium location. You need to bring your own chair, first come, first serve. Now, you can do this. You can uh, buy tickets online for any day of the fair in advance. So you oh. might want to consider that. Yeah. The fair's got a Facebook page and a website. I didn't exactly see the link or the setup for that, but Michelle says you can buy tickets in advance. And you might want to do that rather than stand in line there at one of the gates where you would buy, you know, tickets as you come in. Okay. Yeah. That way you're good to go. You can skip past the line and just keep on going. Right. And then, you know, we'll talk to, uh, I know Michelle's coming in the office today to talk to, uh, to Matt McKee, and I hope we can get her up here to talk yeah. on TV later this week, but she can give us all the details about the headhunters, but everybody at the fair board, very, very excited. And another nostalgic angle is that 
the same lead-in band is going to uh, perform prior to the Kentucky Headhunters. What? Tallahassee Freight. Really? Right. And of course, they were a really popular local band. I've not really heard a lot from them lately, but they're still performing. And they so will perform. Cool. I've seen two times, Jennifer. That was one thing I have to uh, pin down with Michelle. Uh, on the posters, it says 630. On the schedule, it says 6. But regardless, they are okay. the lead-in band or warm-up band or, or uh, whatever you want to call it for the Kentucky Headhunters. So That's you can amazing. see two concerts. It's all country music from both groups. Yep. And so that is on Saturday of the, of the Jackson County Fair at 8 o'clock. And, of course, some other pre-fair activities. We talked about the harness racing on Thursday and Friday. That's only $5 to get in to do that. It went very well last year. Um, two sessions of harness racing. It only cost $5 to get in. They will have the paramutual betting, of course, which is a big draw. People like to kind of take those chances. That's right. Bet on the ponies. We'll and, have to ask Jenna about her, her theory. Okay. Well, okay. So You do it on the name of the horse, of course. Nothing else. Right? So, no, it's the jockey that has the prettiest outfit. Oh, Pete. I haven't heard of that theory before. You didn't know that? No. Well, you know, that's about as scientific as the horse name, right? Yeah. Jenna, what, okay, so when you go to the fair and you're going to do mutual betting, how do you pick the horse that's going to win? I've never done it before, so I wouldn't know how to go about it. Well, you have to have some kind of scientific theory. Mine is the jockey with the prettiest outfit wins. Pete's is the best name. Dad's is the horse with the longest legs. Okay. Which right. makes total sense. No, more that, than there, there, there's some there there's some science there. A more bit. than most, but you girl, you gotta get to the fair and figure out your system. I know, I'm sorry. I kinda like the outfit one. Seems to make sense. Such a girl way to, okay. to go about it. But anyway, whatever your system is for picking that winner, get up and uh Bet on the ponies. Right. It's a lot of fun. Right. Exactly. Well, that's Saturday. You don't have to spend a lot of money. It's just fun, you know? Exactly. Well, so harness racing Thursday and Friday, uh, Kentucky Headhunters Saturday on Sunday. That is the day in the last several years where they've done the opening ceremony. So yes. that's a big deal, too. And that's going to be at 4 p.m. on a Sunday afternoon. Mm -hmm. They'll crown the queen. They'll make some other announcements, uh, et cetera. And they've lined up some other things on, on Saturday or on Sunday as well. Sunday evening, talk about a big bluegrass group, a regional group that's had some traction outside of the region. Open Rail yes. is going to perform on Sunday evening uh, at, the, uh, at the fair. Uh, that's another one of these pre-weekend events. They're also going to have uh, a church service in the morning. Gospel music, gospel, in the, music. gospel music in the afternoon you can and spend evening. the whole day there. And they're going to have a, a, um, a church service, a, a speech by Chris Wallace, who is with World Outreach Ministries. Okay. Real nice guy. I think you've met Chris. He is going to uh, have a, uh, I don't think it's what, what you would call a church service, but a message uh, because it's Sunday there on Sunday evening before Open Rail performs. So all that, and that's just the pre-fair weekend stuff. And then, of course, uh, uh, the regular stuff during the weekend, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay. But what else we want to talk about is uh, this is a behind-the-scenes thing, and this is something that occupies the fair board that you kind of take for granted, and that is the facilities. Yes. There. I mean, it's just like your Amazing house or your business, grounds. you need to keep it up. Yep. You know, appearances and appearances mean everything. Also, uh, you know, you like to have clean grounds, cleanliness, and all four. That stuff just doesn't happen. You have a lot of people working uh, in the weeks up to a the lot, fair yes. and spending money to make improvements. And a lot of the things they do, they do with volunteer labor and so forth, the fair board members, the various committees uh, that are part of the fair. But uh, there are a number of physical upgrades that we're going to talk about right now that you'll notice when you go to the fairgrounds this year, or if okay. you if you don't notice, you will maybe uh, if you take a look because you're listening to what I'm telling you. Here is the grandstand at the Jackson County Fair, look and they how have put spiffy. they have put a lot of money into it. Now it's still the same grandstand, but here are all the things that they've done there. They've done they put a rubberized coating up on the roof. Now uh -huh. that's expensive. There's a lot. That's a pretty big roof up there. It is. But they've done a rubberized roof. They've also uh, they've also uh, done a lot of painting. Uh, they put new concrete down in certain places, so the footing is a little bit better. It's a little smoother. 
uh, walking uh, there up and down along the, the seating. And also they have put a chain link fence that uh, previously separated the stands from the track. It now has a handrail as well as a staircase, once again, okay. for safety reasons and mobility reasons, to make it a little bit easier uh, to uh, have a little extra support when you're walking down to the track from the seating. Uh, also, uh, the hog barn, there's been a big improvement there too. The and little th piggies. Th th there, there it is. Now they've done some work in the hog barn, but the big um, improvement, and this seems like such a, a mundane thing, but it's so important at the fair. If you look up on the ceiling, you see a big new electric fan up there. Yes. They put big new electric fans, uh, ceiling fans up there in the hog barn, just not those stand up fans that they've had before. And if you're a farm girl, and I know you, you're a farm girl, that's very important, <laughs> for, the, so for, important. for the animals during yes. the week. For sometimes sometimes you even hear about animals uh, becoming ill, not very doing well, so. particularly some of the smaller ones because of the intense heat, even with fans blowing uh, and the fact that they're away from the sun. But And the hog barn now, they have uh, some new ceiling fans up there that will uh, help hope, hopefully uh, cool down and regulate the temperature uh, during the fair. These are industrial size fans that have been installed. Uh, meanwhile, I'm getting into your territory now, the horse barn. Okay, the horse barn has received a lot of work. There it is right now. They've put up new metal on the outside. As you can see, it looks pretty sharp. They have done a lot of painting as well. They had a spruce up day where I'm sure they had a lot of fair people, including uh, people that deal with the horses. There is a horse committee mm -hmm. that runs the horse uh, that runs the uh, that runs the horse activities at the fair, including the horse show. And they came and spent a day doing nothing but cleaning, cleaning inside and out, and making it look a lot better. And you can see it looks pretty nice there. That horse barn is not new, but it looks looks pretty good now after they've done all this cleaning. And uh, they plan to put, they've also done some work at the horse arena as well. Yeah, I think they painted it, didn't they? Yes, they did. They, paint, nice. they painted over there in the horse arena. And uh, they want to do some other upgrades at the horse arena in the future, including put up new gates there at the horse arena. Uh, one of the other improvements at the horse barn, besides the painting and the cleanup, is that uh, uh, it's not done yet, but they plan to, before next fair, to have four roll-up doors to the barn, which will make it easier to shut it down when uh, you know there aren't horses in it or sure. there's in activities going on. So uh, lots of work there uh, at the fair. Once again, they benefited from uh, some money coming in from the outside, some grants, some capital grants allocations from the state, but also all these activities that go on at the fair. You know, you, you talk about how hard the fair board works during the year to put on the fair. Uh, and plan it, but they also have these events. Remember the haunted barn I that do. they have during October. Yes. Uh, the dinner in the dust events yep. that they have there. Uh, the flea market things that a a Angelia Hill has done uh, this year. Uh, all those, and when they rent the facility, all these uh, events bring in money that they put towards the betterment of the fair, especially the grounds and the facilities. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, it costs a lot to build these things. They get a lot of in-kind donations in labor and materials from local supporters as well. It really is a great community success story, what happens at the fair every year. I, and that, you know, is, well, that is that is below the radar for a lot of folks, but it's so important oh. to mention. And, you know, later on, you know, we'll maybe mention some of the people that make the fair happen. Uh, if you're involved in the fair, you probably already know that, but they really do, all these people, whether they're on the fair board, they're on the livestock committee, they're on the horse committee, they're on the 4-H uh, advisory council, they all do so much work. They do, and you know, one of the premier projects, and I, this had to have cost a fortune, that they did a long time ago now, uh, seems like yesterday, was paving the midway, um, putting those those paved paths through there. Because when I was growing up, I mean, it was it was a muddy mess or a dusty mess, either way, one or the other. And, you know, you had to walk across gravel and you were all the time twisting your ankle or something because, you know, you're trying to run through it. And, and um, but they have those nice paved paths now through the midway. And it's just so easy to navigate. Um, you know, if you're someone in a wheelchair or stroller, um, it just makes it so much easier to visit the fair. So. 
That's a wonderful addition, too. Right. And, of course, you know, they can't do a capital improvements where they fix everything at once. It's kind no. of a continuing it's process. Ongoing, they yeah. figure what they can do. And, you know, the truth is, even just the money that they bring in for the fair, from gate admissions and, and the vendors and, and all like that, and, and it's not enough. So that's why they do all these volunteer things, uh, the fundraising events and so forth. So yep. when they have these events, that's what the money is going for. It's, it's not anything else. And so, you know, try to remember that uh, whether, you know, you're somebody attending those events or donating to those events. All right. Uh, well, we want to talk about Uncle Sam and some of the money that he sent our way. Oh, uh, of course, the American Rescue Plan. Good. That is the official word for the stimulus money. That yeah. has come to some of the governmental units at the state level, uh, the county level, uh, and below. And uh, a very, there was a very key development that affected a lot of our local entities that we reported a front page story in last Saturday's edition of the Telegram. And this was a decision made at the state level. And what happened was um, it was decided earlier in the year that the, when the federal stimulus money, the the latest allocations got allocated to uh, our cities and in Jackson County, that would be the city of Jackson and the city of Wellston, that the cities would get upwards of a million to a million point two to uh, a million point two dot of one point two million dollars. Mm -hmm. And the money would come in two years and it hasn't arrived yet. But obviously that got Mayor Charlie Hudson in Wellston and Mayor Randy Evans in Jackson excited. Mm -hmm because suddenly you have a lot of money that you weren't counting on to do things that you haven't been able to do in the past. For both of them, they were talking about doing infrastructure projects. Now, Jackson, of course, has the income tax money coming in. They've got a paving project that's gonna start pretty soon, but that does not even begin to cover the income tax money the things with water and sewer lines and like that. Those are the things beneath the ground. The stuff that you don't see right, every Right, that day. are so yeah. important that, you know, you need to address, but maybe you put off because you don't have the money and then, you know, you have water line leaks. The EPA says you got to make this improvement to the sewer plant and all like mm -hmm. that. It all costs a lot of money. Well, here was the development that disappointed uh, the cities. They were supposed to get, as I said, a million dollars upwards that would come sometime this year and the other half the next year. For some reason, I really don't know why, this was a decision at the state level, the townships were not going to get any money. You know, that could be because they thought that the townships didn't have the same needs as the cities and the counties. What? All right. Well, <laughs> Shame the, on you. Well, the Ohio Townships Association and township trustees and fiscal officers they're yelling like a stuck pig, I'm right? I'm saying. You mean you're not going to give us any money? Wait a minute. The rest of us that live in a township have gone through the same things. Right. Well, the state made, the, the state, our state legislators did an about face. And what they did was yeah. they made a redistribution plan. And now some of the money that was going to go to the smaller cities is going to go to the townships. I don't know how much money the townships are going to get. That's bad, though. <laughs> I, I know. Well, they're taking what, it's the same amount of money, so it had to happen that way if the townships were going to get some I money. Guess. Now, Mayor Hudson was outspoken. He put this on Facebook, and then we have it uh, in this article that was in Saturday's paper. He was disappointed not only to lose the money, but because they only took it away from the cities of 50,000 or less in population. The Wait big, a minute. The big cities continued to get the same amount of money that they were going to get anyway. And once again, I don't know what the basis of that decision was. Maybe there was a good reason for it. I'm not trying to, to uh, you know, be critical. But Mayor Hudson felt the redistribution should have affected that everybody, smells, not Pete. just the smaller cities. You know, you might have some politics at work. Uh, power politics, because the cities, of course, have more representatives or whatever, the big cities, because of population. But whatever the, whatever the reason is, now our local cities are going to get about half as much as they were going to get. It's still a windfall that would have never happened if it wouldn't have been for COVID-19 and the support or generosity of the federal government in uh, making this money available. So instead... Mayor Hudson believes that the city of Wellston will now get around 500000 maybe a little more. It will be over two years. They've not gotten the money yet. Mayor Evans told me on Friday that he expects Jackson does not have the exact figure, but he thinks that Jackson will get about 600000 uh, Putting it in uh, proportional, uh, uh, by proportion, 
about half of what they were going to get before. So uh, that's the big story. Uh, and you know, the, the public may not realize that, but what it will do, it will cost them doing, uh, they will do, be able to do about half as many infrastructure projects as they would have if they would have received the full amount. And that's not going to change. Uh, they put that uh, new plan in the state budget bill, and the budget bill passed uh, uh, the legislature, and it was signed by the governor on June the 30th. So it okay. is a done deal. That's okay. not going to change. Uh, Representative Stevens had told Mayor Hudson there may be an extra allocation of infrastructure money that may be available, but how much this is by the time it gets divided up, hard to say. So we'll have to see on that. Okay, well, give credit to uh, the Oak Hill Police Department and the Village of Oak Hill officials to kind of stay up with the times. They're going to, uh, if everything uh, continues on the track that it is now, the police department is going to have a drone. Oh, right. fancy. Police, police Chief David P. Ward is a licensed drone operator, so this kind of opened the door. The second door that opened, and this is very important for a small village that has limited funds, they received a $7,000 grant to, uh, from TLC Energy to be able to purchase the drone. So they've got the drone, uh, the village council, they talked it over uh, you know, with Mayor, uh, Mayor Paul McNeil and the village council, talked it over with Chief Ward. They wanted to get a policy for it uh, because uh, you know, some of the issues with the drone, you know, is this an invasion of privacy You're flying over your house and all like that? Oh. So they're gonna have policies on how it can be used, but uh, uh, that is being reviewed by the village solicitor, Joe Kirby, who's an attorney here in Jackson. But uh, Chief Ward is convinced that it will be a, uh, a, very, effective, uh, a very effective instrument to have. Uh, he said that it can be used to avoid overtime costs because it's an eye in the sky. Uh, it can be used uh, when they're doing a search, looking for missing children, looking for somebody who, uh, who is, a, a, who is a, a suspect, who is running from them. Uh, they can pinpoint where accidents and other crimes are occurring faster. They can even fly the drone around the town and kind of do a patrol without being in the vehicle. Okay. So uh, they feel that this will be uh, very, very useful. Now, I don't know whether drones are, are used by any, uh, any other law enforcement, but Oak Hill Police may be breaking ground on this as far as our local area is concerned. All right. Interesting. Village of Colton, a small place, but there is a lot going on there. Um, Mayor Kim Milliken, of course, uh, has uh, seen a lot of things happen in, our in their village, all because of a $750,000 neighborhood revitalization grant. They got it last year. The work is being done this year, and it is a whole lot of work. One of the tangible things that you can see is a new basketball court. And there, there it is right there. It's very nice. I saw that. I took that picture myself. And that, uh, appropriately enough, Jennifer, is on the same ground where the old school was. Yes. So, you know, where the kids went to school, where they played, they're still playing. They've got That's the basketball so good, yeah. court there uh, just off the main drag there in Colton. But that is just a small thing compared to the other things that have occurred in Colton because of that $750,000 grant. Villagers and people passing through the village may have noticed some of the construction work and excavation that has taken place because of this grant. A lot of the work is already done, but uh, this neighborhood revitalization grant, uh, it paid for the demolition of the school for one thing. Uh, they, also, um, they also have been able to uh, put in uh, some new water meters. Um, they have also uh, been able to install newer, newer, more storm sewers in various locations in the village. Uh, they're also installing handicap ramps uh, at the uh, village building. And later on, this is one thing that isn't done yet, they're going to have a tornado siren uh, oh. in the village. And all that adds up to $750,000. The money doesn't go quite as far as it normally would on a private project because of federal guidelines on how you have to spend it sure. and what you have to pay the workers and so forth. But obviously, it's a good economic thing. A lot of improvements in the village of Colton because of this NRG grant. And of course, uh, some of the work going on is done by local companies. I know Jackson Brothers Construction out of Wilson has done mm -hmm. some. Stockmeister Enterprises here in Jackson has done some. So that work uh, is kind of finishing up now. It's kind of on, its, uh, on, on the last leg. The village of Oak Hill 
Next year hopes to be able to be doing a lot of work with a $750,000 grant. They have made the application to the state. They should hear by the end of the summer whether they get that grant. A uh, Whitaker Wright, who is a grant consultant for uh, the County of Jackson, he works out of a company works out of an office in Columbus for CDC consultants. Uh, he feels that Oak Hill has an excellent chance to get that grant, and that would be a lot of improvements there. So sure. we'll see what happens there. Of course, the city of Jackson has had a neighborhood revitalization grant. The city of Wellston has had two of them. So this has been a grant program that has been very, very good for Jackson County. And frankly, uh, two of the reasons why we've been successful, in addition to the local participation, the work of Whitaker Wright, is uh, the income levels of our residents, which puts you at a higher rating as far as quali quali qualifying for the grant, and of course the needs that you have. Uh, that just goes to show you that the money is needed and the, uh, the, the, state, the state grant officials have been very good about uh, favorably considering projects in Jackson County. All right, in Benton County, we want to tell you about Alice's house. Have you ever heard of it? I have heard the name, yes. Okay, there it is right there. Look uh, how pretty it is. It is the, on uh, at 207 South Sugar Street in MacArthur, and that is the official home of the Benton County uh, Historical and Genealogical Society. And this is a small group of volunteers, an organization that is dynamic. And I say that because, you know, I've seen what they can do. Uh, they have events throughout the year. You know, they did that uh, memorial uh, dedication ceremony in Wilkesville for the Civil War soldier not too long ago. They do some other events as well. But this is their home, Alice's House. They have uh, touring available at Alice's House. Uh, uh, touring is available uh, Wednesdays, Wednesday through Fridays in the, in the afternoons. And Alice's House is not only a Victorian era house, but it has period furnishings in there. They oh, have, cool. So, you know, you can take a tour and kind of see, uh, step back in time and kind of see what it would be like to live in Benton County uh, in the 1900s. Who's Alice? Um, you know, who is Alice? Alice Ogan Runyon. Uh, okay. She lived in that house and her family, I think, donated it to the Very Benton good. County Historical and Geneal Genealogical Society. It I has, knew you'd know the answer. Right, well, I, I read my, my cheat notes here. Uh, Alice's house has a wealth of preserved knowledge that dates back to 1874. And remember, Benton County itself is only back to 1850. That's when the county was formed. It was one of the last ones in Ohio to be formed. Uh, it is a viable source of local history and information. Uh, to help maintain the museum, the Historical and Genealogical Society relies on the support of volunteers who are able to take care of the facility and the collections, give guided tours, and assist people across the country with genealogical research into their local roots and heritage. They do all that there. It's just a small knot of volunteers. I think Deanna Tribe is the current president. Okay. And um, very neat. And Joyce Peters is another person who is retired. She moved back to Vinton County after a, a career in uh, Franklin County, and she does a lot of work there. Lawrence McCorder, who lives in the Hamden area, he is one of the of the of the main spokes of the wheel there as well. But if you ever get a chance to, to go there, please do it. Uh, of course, they'll accept donations, but it is free to visit. Okay, Jennifer, I'm old enough, and I think you may even be old enough to remember. Watch it, Pete. I know. Well, okay. I know when you were the horse queen. The, the horse is out of the barn, <laughs> all right? Do you remember Patty Clark? Yes. Okay. Well, Patty Clark, uh, unfortunately, passed away. She was oh. 94 years old. That happened last month. They had a memorial service for her uh, just uh, this past Thursday. And Patty was well known in the community. She was the wife of Ed Clark, who was the editor at the Jackson Papers for many years. I was the one Ed who- Ed Clark's column. Right, at Sunspots yes. and uh, Our Town. It was yes. called, because uh, it was in different papers. But Patty was uh, not only the wife of the editor and very active in the community and for a number of organizations, but she wrote a column called Patty's Party Line in Time with Patty that was a staple of the old Jackson papers. And let me tell you, sometimes it took up the whole page of the paper and more <laughs> because she had such great contacts. And for somebody who has been in the newspaper business nearly their whole lives, I respect that because yes, she had absolutely. a lot of contacts. She did not time, she wrote out everything by hand. And, you know, there was an old editor 
uh, in Kansas that was very famous in journalism uh, named William Allen White. Mm -hmm. And he used to say he had a small town paper in Kansas, even though he gained some national fame. He said his goal was to have everybody's name in the community in the paper at least once during a calendar year. Well, Patty probably came close to <laughs> achieving that in her time. And uh, she, uh, like I say, they had a memorial service tour there on Thursday, even though she was 94 and a lot of the folks that worked with her that knew her had already passed. There was a, a, a big crowd there sure. to pay tribute to her life, her family members and, and so forth. And because we are in the media business and we have kind of connections back with the old newspaper, I certainly do. Yes. I wanted to mention Patty and uh, pay her tribute for her contribution to, uh, to local journalism. A lot of that. Uh, we will have a uh, column about Patty, my memories of Patty, uh, in our Wednesday paper. And I will tell you, she's very, she's very deserving. It was a social column, but put it this way, Facebook had nothing on yeah. Patty Clark. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll just... Imagine I'll, how hard that was back then. Right. You know, you didn't have cell phones and internet and all that stuff to no, look no, everything up. No, you didn't. You counted you counted on the local newspaper as being one of the main sources. You didn't have all this electronic <laughs> stuff. And Patty was the one who brought this information to you. That's People awesome. waited to read her column as well as Ed's and get the other local news as well. Yeah. All right, the Wellston Rotary Club had its uh, what they call its changing of the guard meeting, Jennifer. And what it is, the organizational year for Rotary is July 1st through June 30th. So about this time of the year, uh, they have a meeting. All the Rotary Clubs do. Jackson had one earlier. Wellston had its uh, one um, on the weekend of July the 1st. Mm -hmm. And uh, new officers were inducted. Okay. And uh, uh, there they are right there. That is a, a picture from that meeting. And I'm going to go down the list of people who were there. Because what they do is they don't only install and announce new officers, honor the old officers. They do some community and club honors as well. But from the left there, uh, if you're looking there uh, on, uh, on, on, on your monitor, if you're watching, uh, the names are uh, from, from the left, Tim Jones, who is the new Rotary Club president. He's now in there. Nicole Summers, who is a board member. Kim Burroughs, who is a board member. Connie Pelletier, former president and a board member. Dana Lockard, former president and a board member. Tom Downard, who had been... Uh, who had been uh, a Rotary Club president two years ago and is now an assistant district governor. Craig Klein, who is the district governor, they got him down for the meeting. And the outgoing, uh, and then you have Tim Jackson, mm -hmm. who was the president, outgoing Rotary president in Wellston. And then the current district governor, Craig Maxey. So uh, they had a, a nice event, a big event. Uh, in addition to uh, the changing of the guard, they did some Paul Harris Fellowships. Paul, a Paul Harris Fellowship is the top honor that you can have if you're a Rotarian or if you receive it from a Rotarian. And Wellston honors some of its own, but also some people in the community for their community service. This year's uh, Paul Harris Fellowships in the Wellston Rotary Club were Rex Holzapple, Tim Jackson, and Terry Witt. Okay. And Terry Witt, Rex Holzapple, of course, uh, associated with the Holzapple family and the businesses there in Wellston. And uh, Terry Witt, of course, is yes. TLC Ministries. Yep. And Tim Jackson, very active with the Jackson County EMS. He is. Uh, kind of like a, he's the HR person with them. Yep. Uh, and he's always out front of the events there, a good ambassador for the EMS. But also, he, of course, he was the president of Rotary for a year. And just like Kim Harless here in Jackson, can you imagine how hard it is to keep a service no. club together? No, and that you, I, it's, it's just I not, cannot. It's just not keeping everybody together and connected and not trying to lose members. But you're trying to raise money still, even though you can't do events and have meetings for things like scholarships and so forth. And you know what? Just like the Jackson Club, they were able to do their scholarships and some of their other things by having some events once things started to let up that they wouldn't normally do. Okay, this past weekend, uh, we're still getting information on it, uh, but the big event this weekend was at Lake Alma. Mm -hmm. They had Christmas in July. They did. I do have verification that Santa Claus did show up. What? We un yeah, he showed up. We said that he we said on TV that he was going to. I didn't want to disappoint the kiddies. What if he paddleboarded? He well, I think he was on a motorcycle, oh. but I have received reliable information that it may have been uh, made possible through the Wellston Lions Club, which uh -huh. does, of course. 
they chauffeur Santa Claus around a lot in they December. Yes. And so we shouldn't be surprised by that. But the Friends of Lake Alma support group do a great job of bringing attention to Lake Alma. They do events out there, cleanup events. Uh, they do events uh, to try to improve the facilities out there. They've done a lot. They support the state park people very well. Lake Alma uh, may not be one of the biggest state parks in Ohio, but it is very popular, especially for camping. Yeah, we had a couple um, traveling through um, on Saturday morning, and they came in and they asked if it was okay. They had their dog with them. They mm -hmm. were traveling in their RV. Mm -hmm. And um, I said, sure, you can sit out on the patio. And anyway, I went out to talk to them, and they said that they were camping at Lake Alma and how pretty it was and how much they were enjoying it. And I thought, well, that's really cool. Something for us to be proud of, you know? It's very it's very picturesque. And there's lots of things that you can do at Lake Alma besides camp. Of course, they got the lake there. The swimming is open now. Uh, they have fishing. I saw somebody pulled out a 40 pound catfish there over the weekend. I saw that. That, that. That'll get people, uh, that'll get, that'll get the fishermen excited. I'd say. And of, co of course they have hiking trails there. They do. They have the island that you can go across the pedestrian bridge yep. and, and explore there a little bit. So uh, uh, a lot to like about, uh, about Lake Alma State Park. Of course here in Jackson County, we also have Jackson Lake State Park we do. outside of Oak Hill. And in Benton County, of course, you really have a top attraction in the Lake Hope State Park. Uh, some of us in Jackson County maybe have not been up there as much as the Benton County folks, but that's kind of considered on the fringe of the very popular Hawking Hills. It is. And they have cabins there. They it's get, gorgeous. I am told that they get a million visitors a year. Now, I'm not that there, wouldn't I'm not there counting all. people, but it is very, very popular. Uh, a lot of facilities there to stay. They have the Lake Hope Lodge, a, a superior restaurant up there. It's Yeah, it's beautiful. It's part of it. They've got a nature center up there. Uh, we try to publicize some of the events out there, outdoor events. You don't have to go and stay there to enjoy those. No. They do things uh, with nature around the lake all the time. It's kind of like the hub for uh, the state park organization in our local area. I know you call Lake Hope sometimes if you're trying to get information about Lake Alma and Lake Jackson. Okay. So... All right, uh, the other thing we wanted to tell you about, this is coming up a little bit later in the year. There will be a Foothills Art Festival this year. Woohoo! Right, Yay! right, right. I know that uh, 400 to 500 pieces are in that show every year. It is truly a regional attraction. All those um, talented, artsy people that I despise because they have talent and I don't. Well, wait a second. Didn't you get any from your mom? None. Okay. Zero, well, zilch. Something. Nada. Something happened. Well, does Lou paint? No. That's it right there. Yeah. Okay. We, we just blab for a living. Okay. That's it. Okay. Well, anyway. Um, it's irritating to me when people are so good at art. The, the Foothills Art Festival. So envious. It's scheduled for uh, the weekend of Friday through Sunday, October 15th through 17th. And the reason that it's in the news is two reasons. Uh, they have announced an early registration deadline because, okay. you know, if you're going to enter something, I mean, you don't decide the day before you're going to uh, do a painting no, or a sculpture. you kind of have to know. But their early registration date, uh, uh, the early registration deadline is Friday, September 3rd by 5 p.m. Uh, you can get more information on this event at, uh, posted on the 2021 Foothill Art Festival page, so you might look for that. Registration forms will also be available on the Facebook page, but the early registration date, if you're thinking about signing up or uh, seeking to, because uh, it's an open thing, but you know, you do have to register, that's Friday, September the 3rd. This will be the 40th year for the Fred Hills wow. Art Festival. Really and neat. the other big news is it's going to be a new place. What? It's not going to be at Canner's Cave 4-H Lodge anymore. I think it's always been there, right? Uh, as far as I know. Wait, it used. I've been there when it was at the winery. It was at the winery. Okay, we'll see. You go back. You're older Long, than I am. A few years ago. Okay, it was at the winery. All right. Before it was at Canner's well, Cave. Well, this year, it's going to be at the Parks Edge Event Center. Oh, okay. Here in Jackson. Obviously, they have a big venue for yeah. that. And so, uh, that is where it's going to be this year. We'll have more information on that uh, you know, okay. as we get closer to that date. So Jennifer, um, I'll be back on Thursday or maybe before if we have a big story to talk about, but we'll talk sure. more about the Jackson County Fair and we'll see if we can get Michelle Baxter up here to give you a firsthand uh, account of what's gonna happen at the Jackson County Fair. But remember, on the heels of the Jackson County Fair will be the Vinton County Junior Fair. 
And we talked about how there's excitement for Jackson County Fair. Denton County Junior Fair yeah. didn't happen last year, so you know they're chomping oh, at the bit. raring to go. Now, um, I know that they did a little changing with the Vinton County because of the Gallia County a few years ago, because they always used to be on the same week, mm -hmm. and then they've changed them around. So is the Vinton County directly after Jackson, or is there a week in between? No, there is no week in between. So as a person, right to... as a person that needs to cover them in the paper, we know that we get, get jump off one horse right onto the other horse. That's right. And in the area, I know people like to hit the fair circuit. Uh, here's how it goes, if I'm remembering correctly: Jackson County Fair next week, Denton County Fair the week after that, Gallia County then Fair Gallia. the week after okay. that, and then the Ross County Fair the week after that. Woo ee! All kind of fun stuff. Right, exactly, and they're all a little bit different, and so they you are. know they all feature entertainment and all the the typical junior fair activities, and of course all the fair food, all the elephant ears you want to eat. What is your favorite fair food, Pete? The favorite fair food that from the Jackson County Fair, this would be simple, and that's just because of uh, what I like. I like to get the steak sandwiches from the Cattlemen's Association. Okay, I agree with you. And the lemon shake-ups to drink. Yes, and you can get them all right there in that area. Mm -hmm. um, the Cattlemen's Association booth, and this is a great plug for them, um, is always my go-to um, actual, like, eat a meal mm -hmm. booth. Okay. And they are down at the livestock, in the livestock area, but it's our local Cattlemen's Association, so they have all beef hot dogs, they have... Um, those ribeye steak sandwiches, they have hamburgers, burgers, cheeseburgers. Yep, all of that, and they cook it right there over over like an open fire. Right. It's it, it's really not so fair. amazing. That scent is in the air. It is so wrong. Right. It's the best. It's the best advertisement that they could have. So and, it is not fair at all. Right, and always remember. I mean, get whatever you want, but remember the local vendors sure. too, because you know, along with the Apple Festival and the other festivals and fairs, there's a mix of uh, concessionaires and vendors that travel the circuit and they've been successful doing that, but there's also lots of local folks there as well. There selling, are. Selling and, you know, they're usually using that money for a, a good cause. For good. So get down, yeah, and if you are going to the local fairs, um, I know the Livestock Committee or the Junior Fair Board or somebody, um, I don't know if they're doing it this year, but in the past they've been doing like ice cream treats and things like that too. So that's always good when you're hot and it's all down in the livestock area. Right, okay. Well, I know that I've been, uh, like the Oak Hill Police, droning on here for a while. Ha <laughs> ha, pun uh, intended again. Thank you, again. thank you. Well, I had to one-up you there. But anyway, I know you've got to do the weather and maybe say some other things, so I will bamboose this seat, and I'm okay. sorry that I talked so long. No, I actually, Pete, it's great because we didn't have a guest today, so okay. you, you're the guest. All right, well, I'm very glad to, very glad to be here, and. Uh, once again, Jackson County Fair starting Thursday evening with harness racing and then something every day after that through, That's right. through Saturday, July the 24th. Look so forward to, to all of that and it's just a good time. Right, and check out all the news, uh, pre-fair news that we'll have in the papers this week. We promise that we'll deliver the information to you there. You got it. Thank all right, you. Pete, thanks. And the Pete's Morning News Update brought to you by Nia Henry, agent for Appalachia Realty. If you are looking to buy or sell or have any real estate needs, call Nia. 740-418-4135 and she'll work hard for you. All right, let's head on over to your weather forecast sponsored by, of course, our friends here at Total Media Radio where you can download that app and get live local radio um, on your phone anywhere in the world that you are, anytime you want to listen, just by downloading. So today... Um, mostly cloudy with showers likely, highs around 83. They are saying that heat index will be around 88 today and your chance of precipitation will be about 60%. For tonight, partly cloudy with a chance of thunderstorms, lows around 68. Um, chance of rain overnight tonight is about 40%. Then looking on to Tuesday, partly cloudy, a 60% chance of rain, highs around 83. Tuesday night, partly cloudy, showers likely, uh, with lows around 67. And Wednesday, once again, about 83, 50-50 chance of rain or something like that. As we go on to the weekend, which it will change 50 times between now and then, uh, looks like a little warmer temperatures, but um, 
that's all right. It's county fair week. That's exactly what you would expect. So, all right. Um, I did get a public service announcement to let you all know about. And this is something really interesting. And it's the um, free tax preparation and financial literacy program of the workforce and business development program at the community action committee of Pike County. Did you get all that? Five times fast, say it. Um, they are offering <clears throat> a couponing in today's world workshop. So I think that's really cool because I know all these people that do couponing and they save all kind of money and I have no idea how to do it. Um, that is the evening of Thursday, July 29th from 6 to 8 p.m. at the Ohio Means Jobs Career Center of Pike County. That's at 941 Market Street in Piketon. Um, the workshop is being offered at no cost, and it's designed to teach the different types of coupons, where to find them, and how to use them. In addition, they'll be discussing shopping strategies, online coupon apps, and money-saving tips. Come prepared to conduct a coupon exchange. Ooh. Um, they do want you to register for the workshop, but I like this. This is fantastic. You can save some money. Uh, for more info and to register for the workshop, call Ashley at 740-289-2371 or toll free at 1-866-820-1185. Seating is limited and there will be light refreshments. So if you've always wanted to know how to coupon um, or learn some of the uh, skills around it, um, you can do that. And that will be July 29th, 6 to 8 at the Ohio Means Jobs Career Center of Pike County. So there you go. All right. And in the world's cutest story, before we get out of here for the day, number one, uh, Richard Branson made it up to space. He came back alive. That's good. Or maybe it's not, depending on whether you like Richard Branson or not. Um, yeah. So he flew Sunday with three company employees 53 miles above the Earth in a final test mission before kicking off commercial space flights next year. Um, he tested the astronaut cabin experience. Um, so there you go. It's uh, They made it. They came back alive in New Mexico. That happened. But world's cutest story of the day. There was a lady... I gotta get this right though. Here we go. Okay. World's cutest story. Jenna, you'll like this one, okay? Um, almost 70 years after she was married, so 70 years, Martha May Ophelia Moon Tucker finally got to try on a wedding dress. She's 94 years old. She's from Birmingham, Alabama, and she got married in 1952. And black women were not allowed in bridal shops back then. Um, so instead of a white gown when she got married, she wore a navy blue dress that she had. Um, recently she was watching, this is so funny, she was watching the movie Coming to America, which is one of the funniest movies ever made, with her granddaughter. And during the wedding scene, she revealed her lifelong dream to try on a wedding dress. Is that not the sweetest thing? So her granddaughter was like, I'm going to make that happen. She's 94 years old. So they, her granddaughter arranged at a local David's bridal shop where she got to go. They gave her a makeover before she went. They did all her makeup and everything for her. And then she got to go to the store and try on wedding dresses. Is that not the sweetest thing? Um... Her granddaughter said when they arrived at David's Bridal, she explained the situation to employees. Everyone was elated to help me do that for her. Everyone was catering to her because I told them her story. Um, she said she enjoyed getting to try on the dresses. I can't express how special it was. It was too special. I've been wanting to do that a long time. Just put one on. Isn't that so cute? The fact that that was even a thing, I just, I'm still confused about that whatever but you go granddaughter you get the the gold star for the day 
and David's bridal for making it happen and being so kind to a lady that uh, never got to try a wedding dress on. That's just nuts. I tell you, nuts. All right. Um, well, we do need to get out of here for the day. And uh, thank you, Miss Jenna, for hanging with us. Miss Jenna's pushing all the right buttons over there. And she looks awful cute today. Thanks. All right. So have you, you're welcome. You, okay. So we asked you this. Do you have your theory down pat on how to bet on the ponies, how to pick the proper pony? I guess I haven't been thinking about it since you asked me, but I can, I can think about it and bring you back an answer tomorrow. Tomorrow. I expect an answer about what your theory of picking the proper pony is. And James is here and I expect his, uh, response as well i think you might have put it on the the comments pick, oh you did yeah you pick the horse whose birthday it is that's what they do when all dogs go to heaven oh okay makes sense how do you know the horse's birthday I, do you I ask it ask the dog that lives in the barn according to that movie oh okay i gotcha <laughs> <laughs> we need to find one of those dogs, don't we? I'd say that dog would know all. All right. Well, thank you so much for tuning in, everyone. We do appreciate you so much. We hope that you had a fantastic uh, rest of the day. And thanks to our good friend Pete for stopping by as well, because uh, without him, we wouldn't know what the heck's going on in the world around us. So have a great day, everyone. We'll be right back here tomorrow. And thank you for watching. Bye-bye.